Hi everyone, welcome back this week. I know I have not been able to make enough full-length videos this month because there are just too many things have been going on at home and in fact it has been a whole month since I have been sitting in this uh, position and make a video. But that doesn't mean I'm not paying attention to COVID and the vaccine development. So this week, let's have an update on the bivalent vaccine human immunological data. Now, is the bivalent vaccine really better than the monovalent vaccine like the manufacturers have said? Or is it just another similar product that may have wasted taxpayers' money? Let's find out with real data. It is not a secret that Americans are not very eager about getting the bivalent booster vaccine. According to some of the latest official statistics, only about 15 million people have received the new bivalent booster compared to about 111 million people who have received the original monovalent booster. For most of them, that was their third dose. But why the slow uptake? I don't think I need to explain too much here. To sum up, a lot of us are just have fatigue about the vaccine and the pandemic. Uh, most of us have already tuned out from paying attention to COVID and the vaccine topics on various media, including here on my channel. And in addition, many people have recently had been infected with COVID and presumably by the BA5 subvariant, including my family members. Now, fortunately, a lot of the people that I know have been infected recently have mild symptoms and they did not appear to have any long lasting lingering symptoms such as those common long COVID symptoms. Nationally, the number of reported cases continue to decline and most of the population have acquired some level of immunity from vaccines or infection. The perception of risk for hospitalizations and deaths has decreased, especially among people with normal immune function and without chronic illnesses. Many officials have tried to persuade the public to get the bivalent vaccine as soon as possible or before Halloween. But they are not very effective, mostly because they've been only presenting qualitative arguments. For example, the new booster can reduce some Omicron infections and transmission, but the actual number is murky even though the industry presents some quantitative antibody title levels, there is a lack of evidence to precisely translate an immunological response into clinical efficacy. Its antibody level, the higher the better. In contrast to the belief that the higher the better, a recent preprint study done by a collaborative research team of biotechnology companies and the Washington State University reported antibody-mediated protection against symptomatic COVID-19 can be achieved at low serum neutralization titers. They showed that a 1 to 30 monoclonal antibody dilution provided about 50% protection against symptomatic COVID in adults without prior immunity. They also modeled that a low level of serum neutralization antibody from vaccine-induced polyclonal antibody supports a similar 50% protection. It is important to note that the study did not suggest that a low level of antibody can provide absolute protection. Similarly, there are also people with a high level of neutralizing antibody from recent boosters contracting COVID. I also have two personal friends who just got COVID this past week after receiving their bivalent booster not too long ago. In other words, there isn't an absolute threshold of protection from a high antibody titers level. The bigger implication is that both vaccine and infection-induced immunity against COVID is a combination of other mechanisms in addition to neutralizing antibodies, such as T-cells, memory B-cells, 
non-neutralizing antibodies, and innate immunity. Unfortunately, even after almost two years of mass vaccination campaign, the majority of the focus is still only on neutralizing antibodies. Since we are talking about antibodies, let's compare data from the industry and academia. The antibody titers are, are the easiest way to assess immunological response against SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus. Both Pfizer and Moderna presented antibodies titer to get regulatory agency authorizations for their bivalent boosters. The official language still believes the bivalent booster will be better than the monovalent booster. It is not surprising, considering they have invested so much taxpayers' money in the new booster. The vaccine manufacturer is also in agreement. Moderna published their BA1 bivalent booster immunological result in the New England Journal of Medicine in early October. The study reported that the new BA1 booster granted a better antibody response to the Omicron variant and is equally well against the ancestral SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus compared to the monovalent booster. But when we look closely at their published data, people with previous infections who received a monovalent booster had a superior neutralizing antibody response than those without infection receiving the new bivalent booster. With so many people having had both symptomatic and asymptomatic Omicron infection in 2022, is the new bivalent vaccine really clinically better than the monovalent booster? Now that literally is a multi-million dollars question that no one has a certain answer. Unfortunately, taxpayers' money has already been spent. Two preprint studies posted near the end of October have cast some doubt on the official and the industrial belief of the superiority of the BA5 bivalent booster. A research team from Harvard University evaluated humoral and cellular responses in 15 individuals who received the original monovalent mRNA booster and in 18 individuals who received the BA5 bivalent mRNA boosters. Both CD8 and CD4 T cell responses increased only modestly following monovalent and bivalent boosters. The median BA5 CD8 positive T cells went from 0.027% to 0.048% with the monovalent booster and from 0.024% to 0.046% with the bivalent booster. Similarly, CD4 positive T cells went from 0.06% to 0.13% with the monovalent booster and went from 0.051% to 0.072% with the bivalent booster. Now, we don't know what these small increases translate to actual protectiveness. In terms of neutralizing antibodies, both monovalent and bivalent boosters stimulated a marked increase. Even though the bivalent booster had a 1.3 times higher level than the monovalent booster, that level was not statistically significant. When immunological data is not significant, it is even harder to make clinical translation predictions. The second preprint was done by a research team from the Columbia University. The researchers used pseudovirus neutralization assays to measure the effect of neutralizing antibodies collected from people who received the bivalent booster as the fourth dose, people who received three or four doses of the original monovalent vaccine, and people who had BA45 infection after mRNA vaccination. At about three to five weeks post booster shot, individuals who received a fourth vaccine dose with a bivalent mRNA vaccine targeting BA45 
had similar neutralizing antibody titers as those receiving a fourth monovalent mRNA vaccine against all SARS-CoV-2 variants tested, including BA.4.5. Now, interestingly, those who received a fourth monovalent vaccine had a slightly higher neutralizing antibody titer than those who received the bivalent vaccine against three other viruses that are similar to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now, the conclusion is that the bivalent booster given as the fourth dose did not induce superior or higher neutralizing antibody responses in humans. So again, we have opposing narratives and evidence about the bivalent booster's superiority. White House officials continue to believe the industrial data more than work produced by the academia, arguing the academic studies had a small sample size. The reality is that studies from the industry will always be bigger, have more sample size than the academia. But there is also apparent competing interest from industrial studies. They must sell their products. In case you don't know, after the FDA gave EUA to the new bivalent booster, all the old monovalent boosters that were in the market were no longer legal to use in the US. But remember, taxpayers had already paid for all the old monovalent vaccines. Where did they go? I couldn't find any information on that. Were they being donated to other countries, or were they simply going to the dumpsters? If a new product is better than the old product, then I think it is logical to buy the new product. But if the improvement is questionable or marginal, is that a wise way to spend taxpayers' money? Or is it just a way to guarantee profit for the big pharmaceutical industry? Let me know what you think in the comment section below. That is all for this week. Now, it is pretty clear to me that a lot of people are no longer interested in listening to COVID-19 and vaccine-related topics. And I have long been preparing my channel or my content to shift a little bit to a more diverse area. I know many of you initially subscribed to my channel because of COVID-19 and vaccine topics. But if you think I have proven myself to be a trustworthy source of health information and you like the way that I present, then I hope to see you again in my next and future videos. Now lastly, please stay safe, stay healthy, and take care. Bye.